this morning our words of exhortation around the table will be coming from our brother Chuck this morning. And he's entitled his uh, talk this morning to us, his exhortation, Jesus Firstborn of the Dead. And has, we, he's asked that we read from the 10th chapter of Hebrews, verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of, of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, Hebrews 19 through 25, and our brother Chuck will be exhorting us again on his title, Jesus, Firstborn of the Dead. Brother Chuck. Good morning. It's an article of faith that Jesus was born into this world as a human baby. Now, mothers have been giving birth for thousands of years, so this is something that we understand. This is something that's clearly understood. Yet, when push comes to shove, even baptized believers can start to bend under the continuous pressure of a world that prefers fables and stories. But when we consult the counsel of Scripture, we find there's no room for doubt. Jesus was a man. The Apostle Peter said in Acts 2, verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The apostle Peter was announcing what he knew to be God's truth, to the nation of Israel. There were those who would say that Jesus was an angel or that Jesus was a spirit. But Peter says in verse 21 that he was a man attested by God. Other translations say that he was approved or he was endorsed by God. Peter understood that the miracles that had seized their attention were acts of God which testified to the truth of the divine message. And then Peter calls him a man again in the very next verse, just to make sure we understand. The Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. King David was a man, and he had human descendants, which are listed in Matthew 1. Jesus was a man, born as a man, and descended from other men, including the first man, Adam, who is specifically named in Luke 3. Romans 5.15 says, But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, 
abound to the many. So Paul refers to the one man, Jesus Christ. And as Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So again, Jesus is called a man. If there is any question, if there's any doubt, if there's an ambiguous verse, we can bring it back to verses that are clear on this point. You don't need to study theology, and you don't need to study Greek. Anyone who can read a book for themselves can answer this simple question. Jesus was a man, but he was also a worshiper of God the Father. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus himself taught us how to pray and to direct our prayers to God the Father. It was always his purpose to bring wayward men back to the living God. Reconciliation with God the Father is the key to everything Jesus is doing. Scripture tells us Jesus often withdrew by himself to pray, as in Luke 5, 16. And how did Jesus pray? If we look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, at that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. So, here are your doctors of theology, and here are your university professors. These things were hidden from the wise and the learned, but they were revealed to little children who are willing to ask their heavenly Father. John verse 17, verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. And in Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. So Jesus prayed to the same Father God, the Father of us all, whom we worship. And Jesus taught others to do the same. Jesus taught Israel about the living God that they tried to leave behind. Jesus prayed and glorified God, sang hymns to God the Father with the apostles, and he worshipped God with them. Jesus did not teach that he himself should be worshipped by men. He would be glorified by God and men after his sanctification. But that would come later. When the resurrected Christ returns, he will lead the assembly of the faithful in singing hymns of praise to God, continuing the practice of offering the right worship due to God the Father. He was a worshiper of God the Father when he walked the earth as a man. And after he's resurrected and sanctified and purified and glorified and comes back to earth, Jesus will worship God the Father as his God. Well, we also know that Jesus wasn't, Jesus wasn't just a man. He was a representative of men like himself. He was chosen from people like him. Hebrews 2 Verse 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He doesn't call them his superiors. He doesn't refer to them as his subordinates. They are his peers. They are his brothers, like Joseph and his eleven brothers, they were all fathers of the same son, just as we are all going to be children of the same God. Verse 12 saying, I will proclaim 
your name to my brethren. Jesus will proclaim the living God by name to his brethren. And then, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. The picture we have here is of the resurrected Christ, not as the object of worship, but Jesus as a member of the assembly leading people in the worship of God the Father. That's why he's singing praises to God, and that's why he's in the midst of the congregation. These are his brethren. We see most of the previous points reinforced in Hebrews 2. Jesus and his brethren all recognize the one Father as God of all, but we also see that Jesus, even resurrected and transformed and glorified, referred to the congregation of the righteous as his brethren. The world wants to make him out to be different than we are. They might as well say, he's not like you. Even if that means creating a false messiah, that's easier than recognizing what the Bible teaches. But Jesus knows his own people are those human beings who perform the righteous deeds of faith. These are his brethren. The cross-reference to Psalm 22 clearly shows the suffering of Messiah is followed by his restoration to the assembly of the faithful, where he sings praises to God the Father. If you want to follow the progression, Psalm 22 is a great place to go. And you follow it through to the end, and the man they killed is back singing praises to God. Hebrews 2, verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. It would be enough to say he was flesh and blood as we are. But it doesn't just say he was flesh and blood. It says, he himself, emphasizing this point by stating it again. It's enough to say he, but now they're saying he himself. Likewise, refers to God's other flesh and blood children. He himself likewise partook of flesh and blood. But then it also adds the word also, which repeats the association with his brethren. He himself likewise also. It would be enough to say he, but the inspired author is just pounding on this point. He himself likewise also was of the same flesh and blood. Jesus was an ordinary human, consisting of flesh and blood, made of the dust of the earth, like the first Adam, which is why he was always subject to death until God raised him. So Jesus was a representative man. He was one chosen from among his brethren. And as our representative, Jesus was chosen for our high priest. As it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. The Old Testament principle is that the priest is the representative of God to the people and the representative of the people before God. God has provided many forms of teaching, one of which is to have men speak to us in our own language. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad he does. He shows us lessons in human lives, he shows us lessons in the history recorded in the scriptures, but I'm very glad that he has chosen to speak to us through the voices of men, even in our own language. A priest 
was responsible to teach the people about God. That's what it means when it says Israel was the light of the world. The world was men running around, killing each other, taking each other's stuff, everybody wanting to be the top dog. The light of Israel was to tell men what God wanted, and more particularly, to create a place where things would be done in the order that God has described where the stranger was not a victim to be plucked, where if you were in debt and sold yourself as a slave, that was not your doom. You could be returned to the land of your fathers in the year of Jubilee. Israel was to be a place where there was justice, where good was rewarded and evil was punished. It was to be a special place. And how could Israel be the light of the world unless it was teaching about God. The truth of good and evil revealed by God the Father was taught by the priests. That's why they came to the temple, to hear the word of God. Even if it was just to hear the reading, there would be a learning. That's the purpose of a priest. Secondarily, he would offer sacrifices on their behalf. Now, is it just because by bringing a lamb that your sins are forgiven? No! God doesn't need a lamb. He has lots of lambs. All the lambs are his. He doesn't want the sacrifice. He wants you. And that hasn't changed. The purpose of the sacrifice was teaching. To teach that I have sinned, and the penalty of sin is death. But I recognize that there is a just and compassionate God who will understand if I repent. So again, even if you say, oh no, the purpose of the priest is to do the Mosaic sacrifice, that's still teaching. And that's what we find in Jesus. Jesus taught the people. And even in his sacrifice, he was teaching. Now, it makes sense that this function would be limited to the priests. Because God is a living being. We sometimes forget that. We want to make God a, a philosophy of living. And, you know, we have a moral atheist. We, we seem to have a lot of com in common with them. But only at first glance. Because God is a living being with a personality, and that includes things that he likes. God told us what he likes. He told us what is good. And there are also things he strongly dislikes, very strongly. One of the lessons of the Old Testament is that when God speaks his mind, like when somebody is struck dead, that was done as an example he doesn't keep striking people dead every time because now he's spoken and now you know. So if it's a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath or a man trying to steady the ark because it's wobbly, God let, made his opinion known and that's enough. He's spoken and then it's up to us to listen. God has things he likes. He told us what they are. God has things he strongly dislikes, and he told us what they are. We don't go in without any knowledge at all. He's told us. The purpose in having the priest approach God is to make peace with him. So it makes sense. Do you want a priest who's going to go in and foul it up? You know, do you want a priest who's going to go in and blaspheme in front of the temple or in front of the ark? No. No, you don't. You want a priest who's respectful to the power and the, the very fact that God is and that he cares. So it makes sense to train the priests and limit any potential for provocation. You might notice that later on when they picked priests of their own liking, things did not go well. Things were not done decently and in order. So, 
Was Jesus a high priest? Strangely enough, this has been seriously questioned even in our own day. Was he a high priest? Well, I'm going to turn again to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So Jesus is a high priest. In fact, he's the high priest of our faith. He's the high priest of our church. So the inspired scriptures address this directly. Jesus is our high priest, and there's no other like him. There's only one. Jesus is the reality of which the Old Testament priesthood was a shadow. We're told the Old Testament was shadowy forms which were crystallized and brought into the light in Jesus, where we can see what a high priest was supposed to be. While Jesus brought the age of Moses to a close, he fulfilled the purpose of the priest to teach the people and represent them before God. In Hebrews 4.14 we see, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was accepted into heaven where he functions as our representative high priest before God. Being born of corrupt flesh and blood as we are, he can easily sympathize with us in the weakness of our own flesh. And what kind of weaknesses do we have? Oh, we seek after our own pleasures. We avoid our own pain. And then there's always the fear of death. Jesus knew all these things. So no matter what we suffer, he knows. He understands. He empathizes and he cares. Our high priest in heaven knows perfectly well how we struggle between the attractions of the flesh and the guidance of the spirit. And we see in the scripture those two are the opposites. The spirit versus the flesh. As our high priest, Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice, or he offered the complete sacrifice. In Hebrews 7.26 we read, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Why? It tells us. Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. So, we have this simple fact. Jesus was born perishable, and he was changed to become imperishable. The fundamental problem is that God is spirit, but our flesh and blood is perishable and corrupt. We cannot truly and completely be part of the kingdom of God without undergoing this transformation ourselves. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. So Paul doesn't answer all of our questions, but he makes it clear how we will be changed. 
We will all be made imperishable, that is, immortal. We will be incapable of death or decay. And this is how we will follow Jesus in the kingdom. We too will be made immortal and incorruptible. This is how Jesus was able to enter heaven itself. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But once transformed, Jesus was no longer ordinary flesh and blood. At his sacrifice, he fulfilled the law of sacrifice. Contrary to the teaching of some, he did not ignore the Mosaic law as being unnecessary. And when he offered himself on the cross, he deliberately repudiated the needs of the flesh in preference to the spirit. And he offered the perfect sacrifice. The high priest made a sacrifice for himself to make himself acceptable before God because he was a creature composed of the corruption of the earth. And then he made a sacrifice on behalf of all the people. But Jesus' sacrifice would bring the Mosaic law of sacrifice to an end. He made the one sacrifice, and all the sacrifices of the law were satisfied. There was no longer any need for all the sacrifices they had repeated over and over again because Jesus' one sacrifice covered them all. And as our high priest, he went before us to open the path to God. As it says in Hebrews six nineteen, we have this confidence as a sure and strong anchor for our lives. This confidence goes into the holy place behind the curtain where Jesus went before us on our behalf. He has become the chief priest forever in the way Melchizedek was a priest. The Holy of Holies was never seen by most people, including most of the priests. The holy place was behind a huge curtain, and only the high priest was allowed to enter, and then only once a year, and he had to bring the proper sacrifice. Jesus, as our high priest, brought the sacrifice of a holy life, and he's capable and qualified to enter even into the presence of God, which is what the holy place symbolized. This is where Jesus, the man whom God desired, awaits the kingdom of God. Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. We often overlook the significance of that. In a family, the firstborn was the eldest child. But of course, it really doesn't have much significance unless there's a secondborn and a thirdborn, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, and so on. Jesus was the firstborn of the dead, and like the eldest son, he was first in preeminence. Colossians 1.18 tells us, He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Jesus was the first in sequence. He was the first in time, but he's also first in preeminence. With Jesus, spiritual Israel, which is the church, begins. Jesus will have the leadership of the church that is to come. And Jesus is only the first of many. Romans 8.29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So scripture is clear. Jesus will have many siblings, many brothers and sisters, and he himself is only the first of many to come. And this is where it becomes important to us. There will be others to come who will be made like Jesus. We have an opportunity to become a part of the age to come. Jesus was born like we are so that we can become like he is. 
Jesus himself had to be transformed. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So when Jesus was flesh and blood, he could not inherit the kingdom of God. When Jesus was perishable, how could he inherit that which was imperishable? He could not. Jesus needed to be transformed when he was raised from the dead. This is the same transformation that awaits us. This is a paradox that stumbles common theologians and scholars to this day. Mainstream churches fight against Bible teaching and ignorance of this simple fact that Jesus was born perishable and he changed to become imperishable. He was born without an inheritance and he was raised to the inheritance of Abraham. The fundamental problem is that God is a spirit, as we know from John 4.24, but flesh and blood is perishable and corrupt. We cannot truly and completely become part of the kingdom of God without undergoing this transformation ourselves. And we will be transformed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So Paul tells us that we are being transformed. Even now, it's already begun. Just as we will be changed outwardly, we are being changed inwardly. And this might even be the more difficult of the two. But we need to get ready to do the work that Jesus was doing and that we will continue to do with him when he returns. And we will be one with Jesus and with the Father. John 17, 22 says, The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Finally, Jesus foresees the day when we will be like him. We will be in unity together with him and with God the Father, God and Jesus and us. That's the unity that Jesus looks forward. And this is the completion of our transformation within and without. In conclusion then, what did this mean to Jesus? Well, First, in his great compassion, God the Father saw that the sons of Adam needed help. He foresaw the solution from the beginning when he prophesied in Genesis 3 that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. God inspired a living man, Jesus, who was made like you and I, to face the great enemy of the Spirit and to display the flesh as defeated, as raised up on a pole, as we read in John 3.14. Just as Moses required the high priest to represent his kinsmen, Jesus represented us in making his public sacrifice. And Jesus himself was sanctified by sacrifice so that he could serve as high priest for us. His death, though it's made out to be a murder by evil men, has to be considered as an act of self-sacrificing love. Jesus knew he would be killed. Jesus went to Jerusalem knowing he would be killed. When Jesus went to Jerusalem, he left them no other choice. Maybe he could have hidden in the caves and survived. We don't know. But Jesus walked directly into that trap, knowing exactly what everyone was going to do. 
out of all the so-called players, whether Herod or Pilate or anyone else, Jesus is the only one who knew what he was doing. And he sacrificed himself as an act of love which was accepted by God the Father. And God raised him up again so that he might always serve as our high priest and representative and he'll always be ready to help us in time of need. So what does it mean to us? We live in a world that rejects what God has written. Real easy. Puh. Don't care. So what? Don't tell me. They do not even regard scripture as worth reading. There are people who pontificate on what the Bible teaches, but they themselves don't even know what it says. The churches of this land can only offer their tradition and their superstition to comfort the dying. And a pale comfort it is. They make up a story, no, they're not really dead, or they make up a story, everybody will be in the kingdom of God. They make up a story when God has already told us what he's doing. God saw that men were dying and passing out of existence, and God had compassion on them. But the common superstition of the churches is, they don't really die. This is simply denial, and there's no comfort there at all. God provided a dying man of flesh in the likeness of Adam to redeem mankind. But the, tra the tradition of the churches teach that the Savior could not really be dead, even when he was buried in the grave. They come up with things for him to do. You know, perhaps they would have him lying still for three days, but most likely they invite him going someplace and talking to other dead people, which is not what the scripture teaches. Jesus was a man who could die. He faced the fear of death just as we do. And he really did sacrifice his life so that we could live. How could it be otherwise? The false religion that calls itself Christian preaches against the Christ of the scriptures. The scriptures say he died. The churches say, no, he didn't. The scripture teaches men die. The churches teach, no, they don't. The scripture teaches that Jesus will establish the kingdom of God on earth. And they say, wait a minute. Now, let me explain it to you. It's really, the, the church is really the kingdom of God. That's, that's really all there is. No, the Bible has more. The false religion that calls itself Christian preaches against the salvation which God has offered. If we do right, if we please God, God has said he will raise us from the dead to be with him in his kingdom. The churches say, no, he doesn't. That's not how it is. They reject the Bible teaching that a mortal man was purified and sanctified as preparation for service in God's kingdom. But the Bible contradicts this tradition. And the Bible contradicts this superstition which was designed by men. For us to realize what God has promised we have to recognize that promise, we have to accept that promise, and we have to follow. And that's what Jesus has taught us to do. In closing then, we remember that it was in God's great compassion that he saw what men were doing. He saw how men were living and he recognized this world needed help. And he foresaw the solution that he would send a man who would teach his word. He would send a man who could offer the perfect sacrifice. And he would send a man who would display the flesh as defeated. Who would crush the head of the serpent as we see in Genesis. He gave us a living man made like you and I 
flesh and blood, to defeat the flesh in the arena where it thrives. And this flesh was the great enemy of the spirit. Jesus represented us as our high priest when he made his perfect public sacrifice. And Jesus himself was sanctified and purified and transformed and made immortal so that he could always represent us before God. God raised him up again so that we will always have help in time of need. Finally, I will read from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Thank you, Brother Chuck, for the real message of hope, the gospel news, that there is something much greater than what we see in the world today. So let's continue our service by singing together to, from hymn number 242. Uh, this is my body, Jesus the Savior said, as he gave them bread. And in a body prepared, God's will was done. Christ's victory won, so we remember him, hymn number 242. Brother was mentioning today, I was thinking of some things uh, some of you probably saw on the news that it was the 25th anniversary of the Hubble uh, telescope, and they were kind of commenting on the wonderful images that come out of it. And if any of you have seen them, they're just amazing images. And it reminds us of our Creator and 
the beautiful and wonderful things he's made and he does for us. I was thinking also um, when our brother was speaking to us this morning that in the 45th Psalm, uh, we know uh, written by apparently Korah's relatives, it says um, in verse 4, in your majesty ride forth victoriously for the cause of truth and to defend the right. Let your right hand teach you dread deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your divine throne endures forever and ever. Your royal scepter is a scepter of equity. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From, every, from ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. So it talks here uh, in the seventh verse that God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Uh, I, I maybe had mentioned this before, but I like to bring it up because, you know, I kind of go into the hospital a little bit, and Russ made a big mistake one time. He went in, and uh, per, this was probably about 10, 15 years ago, and the person who was doing uh, the work on me, biopsy, I referred to that person as an intern because he wasn't uh, the doctor, hadn't reached that level yet. But I was reprimanded by the head doctor by saying, He's not an intern, he's a fellow. And I'm like, at the time, well, what's the difference? <laughs> you know, there's a big difference, you know. So the fellow is the one that's come up the ranks and he's there with the top. Um, he's going to, he's with them, he's among them. But behind the scenes was the higher doctor watching what he was doing. As Chuck said, the teacher, he was teaching the, the new fellow that had come along. But Again, you can see that analogy when you look at the 45th Psalm and he says in verse 7 that God has anointed you with a, a full oil of gladness above your fellows. So you can see he's related to them, but he's above them as our brother brought out this morning. And at the same time, I was thinking that the people who wrote this Psalm were Korah's sons. And if you know the story of Korah, he rebelled against God. So his sons are the ones writing this, knowing that his father rebelled. And why was they, why were they rebelling? Because Korah thought he could do the things that were done by Aaron. There was this, you know, I can do that. You know, why is he above me? Well, there was a reason for that, just as our brother this morning brought out that there was a reason that Jesus is above us, but our fellow at the same time. So we know what he's been through. We know that he sees things. A teaching moment that I was thinking again, as uh, Brother Chuck was uh, exhorting us, was how Jesus himself said to his uh, disciples that he had to go back and heal Lazarus. And I don't know if you remember that, but they're like, are you crazy? They tried to stone you last time. Why would you do that? Why would you even think about doing that? And I'm thinking that would be me saying that. Why would you think about doing that? Because he knew he had to do work in the light, is what he told them. So he was the light of the world. Even though the world was dangerous, he knew that his father had work for him to do during that time. And so... As our brother brought out from Romans 8, there are many brothers coming after this firstborn from the dead. Now, there are others had been resurrected, uh, we know in the Bible, but they died. Jesus was that firstborn, and as he brought out in Romans 8, there will be many others because firstborn implies, infers is probably a better word, that there'll be more to come. And that's why we're here. That's the hope that we have. And again, a, a wonderful hope that we have. So I thought I would read from uh, the book of Luke and chapter 22, verses 14 to 20, describing the Last Supper. And when the hour had come, he sat at table, and the apostles 
with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after supper, saying, This cup, which is poured out for us, is the new covenant in my blood. And we see that we are told, as our brother mentioned this morning, he asks us not to neglect that. And that's why we're here. We are not neglecting his commandment. And of course, it's not just to remember today, but every day we remember him. So keeping this in mind, I'm calling upon our brother Mark to give thanks for the bread at this time. Our Father in heaven, we do come before you at this time, mindful of the words of your scripture and the things that you have promised in the law and in the prophets, and to the fathers of old, descendants of Adam who were not perfect just as we are not. We see you working in their lives, Father, and your scripture, and we see the fulfillment of all that in your only begotten Son. We know the hope that we have in him hope of life everlasting, the hope of a kingdom on this earth, the hope of our sins being forgiven. We see in him all that you intended when you created the earth. And we want to be part of that. We have faith in this and we believe in it and we know that all that you have promised will come to pass. And so, Father, when we read of his sacrifice and of his death, we are mindful of our own sins and our own shortcomings that it was for us, because you love the world, that you would give your only begotten. And so as we remember him this morning, Father, we partake of this bread, a symbol of the covenant that has been made, of his body which was given in sacrifice. And so, Father, we keep in remembrance his death, mindful also of his resurrection and the promise of his coming. We thank you for these lessons, and we pray that you would help us to keep them with us always. In Jesus' name, amen. It's recorded that after he had given thanks for the bread, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body broken for you in remembrance of me.
Um, we know that it said, likewise, he gave thanks for the cup, and I'll call upon our brother Ramazani to offer that prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this morning as you remind us about your son, Jesus Christ, the firstborn, the first high priest of our faith. Now, to remember him, we have the cup of wine that, that, that is representing his blood. We need your blessing to be upon this cup. We need your blessing upon each and every one who is ready to drink this cup, which is representing his blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After you give a thanks for the cup, he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Do you eat this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. 